right, you guys, you might want to sit down for this one because I'm about to blow your mind. Let's talk about the undeniable, overwhelming, ridiculous amount of evidence supporting the cover-up of a murder. What's up, YouTube? My name is Shiro, and welcome to my channel where I talk all things true crime, missing persons, and I share the untold stories of those in the Black community that need more attention. If you're new here, I want to welcome you. Come on in. Feel free to suss out my vibe. See if you like it. And if you do, hit that subscribe button. And for all of you returning subscribers, you already know that you are family now. And it's so good to have you back in the virtual space once again. So as you know, I'm currently covering the case of Tamla Horsford the beautiful mother of six from the Caribbean who went to an adult sleepover and never made it home. If you'd like to catch up on what I've covered so far, you can find her story in the link below. This video is for all of you who still have your doubts and despite the insurmountable amount of evidence and red flags, refuse to believe that racism has anything to do with Tamla's case not being solved. I plan to legitimize these red flags for you with some receipts. Because the truth is, Tamla's case is surrounded by so much corruption, the only way I feel she'll get justice is for the FBI to get involved. These are the facts you can't ignore about the Tamla Horsford case. Before I begin, I just want to say I had to pause editing on the remaining content and create this intermission video before wrapping up this project. Here's your disclaimer so you can choose whether or not you want to continue following my content on Tamla Horsford's case. Number one, if you're okay with pretending racism is not a major factor in Tamla's death, this video is not for you. Number two, if you're offended or uncomfortable with me calling out or holding law enforcement accountable, this video is also not for you. And to be clear, I am not anti-law enforcement, but I am strongly anti-corruption. And there is a distinct difference. I happen to have a healthy respect for the badge, but I expect integrity because no one is above the law. I personally do not feel like it's fair or even possible to tell Tamla's story while omitting what I feel is the most critical component of her case. The end goal is justice, you guys. And if racism is the roadblock impeding on the efficacy of justice for Tamla, how the hell can we expect to achieve it? You can't go around the problem, you gotta go through it. So now that you know what to expect, feel free to either click off or proceed at your own discretion. With that said, if you've chosen to stick with me, let's get right into it. The biggest problem here is that it feels like everybody involved with Tamla's case is corrupt. Let me explain. Forsyth is a petri dish of corruption and blatant racism. From its dark history that harbors the Rob Edwards lynching of 1912 to present day, not much has changed. And in the death investigation of Tamla Horsford, the loss of integrity created due to the conflicts of interest between law enforcement and those who were present the night she died is enough to make anybody furious. To be honest, I don't know if there was one decent person handling Tamla's case, because after doing my research, I struggled to find one. Forsyth County, novel one. Hi, yes, um, I, I need an ambulance and a place to my home. What's the address? Since day one, when Tamla's body was found lying face down in the backyard of the homeowner, things didn't add up. From the strange and eerily calm 911 call to the lack of professionalism and due diligence by law enforcement, it wasn't long before I realized that when you try to put two and two together in Forsyth County, the math ain't mathing. So let's start from the beginning. Corporal Corey Miller was the first responding officer to arrive on the scene, and he was able to look at Tamla and determine she was in fact deceased based off the medical degree he somehow miraculously manifested from his butt cheeks and thus proceeded to cancel EMS. He canceled EMS. He canceled EMS. And I think you'll find it interesting that Miller shares mutual friends with the homeowner, John Myers and was well aware of this relationship upon arrival. Oh, and would you like a receipt with that? What's going on right now? I do request that you not come up here. Everybody is fine as far as your daughter and Jose and everybody that goes. If you, I'm Paul Miller. I understand. I understand this is an act of crime scene right now. We, even if you show up here, you're going to stay outside your vehicle. We can't let you inside the house. Uh, 
control of this property because it's an active crime scene. I'm, I'm just trying to be very respectful to you. I know it's your home. And if you try to barge your way in, unfortunately, you'll be taken into custody. And I do not want that to happen. And she's fine. She's fine. I actually, I actually know your daughter. We, we have some beautiful friends together. Um, and you know, I've been in here talking with her. She's fine. She is fine. Mike Christian, another officer who responded to the scene, would be the lead investigator on the case and was very familiar with Jose Barrera. Remember, he's the boyfriend of the homeowner, John Myers, who was the pretrial probation officer at the time and was also present at the slumber party the night in question. And furthermore, by his own account, according to the timeline, would have been the last person to see Tamla alive. Now, right off the bat, you have two people at a potential crime scene who are comfortably familiar with two of the responding officers. Yet, behold the caveat. Good old Mike Christian, the lead investigator of this case, is a <laughs> Oops, did I say that? He was as pissed for of an officer as they come, and the absolute worst to be in charge of anybody's case. Signed to the Tamala Hosford case, this man, veteran sheriff's investigator Mike Christian. He's snapping pictures of her dead body. This woman says she was having an affair with Christian at the time. This internal affairs investigation we obtained through open records shows Christian's accused of routinely sending her and others crime scene pictures, videos, and others personal information. Not only did he share crime scene photos and sensitive information with his mistresses via text messages, but his insensitive <laughs> referred to Tamla as the porch lady. And if that's not enough to make you loathe this unworthy testicle, he also sent racist tweets to his girlfriends depicting himself taunting Tamla's husband about her death. Would you like receipts with that? Here you go. On November 4th, Christian sent a Snapchat message to one of his girlfriends pretending as if he was notifying Tamla's husband of her death. It read, and I quote, Hello, sir. I know we've never met but I'm here to tell you that your wife and mother of your six children is dead. Oh yes, I am happy to report that she was really, really drunk, trip landed face down in the backyard, either through hypothermia, positional asphyxia, or aspirated on her own puke. Not sure which one. I know you have fun memories. Enjoy Carol and these six boys who are now going ape shit." End quote. This idiot really thought this shit was funny. In another message, he opens with, and I quote, greetings from racist cracker bastard murder covering up land. How are you? It's a nice rainy day. Good for digging shallow graves by the roadside. End quote. This kind of behavior is just unacceptable. How would you feel if this man was in charge of investigating your loved one's case. After dealing with that, how would it even be possible for you to trust that any work done up until that point had been done with integrity or professionalism? He didn't even have a basic level of respect for Tamla or her family. He proceeded to say things that were in such horrible taste, indicative of the donkey he is. But when asked by the GBI during an interview about why he sent the Snapchat messages, he claimed it was sarcasm in poor taste. So I say in response to my previous claim that he's a <laughs> though self-proclaimed, before anybody decides to come for me about that, that too was my sarcasm in poor taste, allegedly. Keep in mind that he was the lead investigator on this case. The lead investigator. I'll say it again. He was the lead investigator. And you wonder why this case has gone nowhere? Not only was this man accused of sharing sensitive information and photos of Tamla's case, he also shared information with his friends about other cases as well. And to make things worse, one of his girlfriends was a former victim from a case he was in charge of overseeing. So not only is this man a horrible excuse for a human being, he is also a predator. To internal affairs. Here's his job as a cop to find women. This internal affairs report confirms one of the women with whom Christian was having an affair was a victim of a crime he was investigating, and that Christian often called and texted them throughout his shifts and routinely met with the women 
while on duty. And have you know, when two of his girlfriends reported him to Internal Affairs and the evidence started to mount, good old Mike Christian, proud ambassador of the racist cracker bastard covering up land, chose to pack his bags, resign, and endure the walk of shame away from law enforcement, just like a little Then there's investigator Andy Kalin, former direct supervisor and good friends with Jose Barrera. Kalin's subsequent behavior is a perfect example of why it is not a good idea to work a case with someone whom you have a personal relationship with and is thus frowned upon. Kalin served as one of the supervisors assigned to Tamla's case, but despite his position, he would allegedly backdoor information to Jose on several occasions, one being the fact that Tamla's good friend, Michelle Graves, was suspicious about Tamla's manner of death and had been asking him in particular, along with other people, questions about what happened. This prompted Jose to research sensitive information about Michelle to find out who she is and what she'd been saying. He then shared that information with his girlfriend, John, who then turned around and shared it with the other ladies who were at the sleepover that night. Kaylin also updated Jose on the results of Tamla's autopsy before it was officially released to the public, or to Tamla's family. He was able to access this none of his business information because he and the deputy coroner happened to be good friends. Now, Tamla's friend, Michelle Graves, whom I can't say enough about, y'all, if you don't have a friend like Michelle, then you don't have a real friend. I'm gonna tell you that right now. She was able to put two and two together when her many questions provoked Jean and her nosy little ex-husband to tell her that she was going to see just why Tamla died when the toxicology report came back, but they said it as if they already knew the outcome. They made the comment before any information had officially been released. Hmm, now that's strange. So they essentially told on themselves. When news of this case first broke, it was alleged that Jose called Andy Kalen prior to dialing 911. So people speculated Kalen may have helped advise Jose on what to do following a potentially nefarious incident. Both denied speaking prior to the 911 call, but Kaylin did admit phoning Jose a few times after Tamla was officially reported dead. And though the GBI claimed Jose's phone didn't reflect the call, no one mentioned having investigated Kaylin's phone records or records from a house phone. So let's talk about this deputy coroner who doesn't mind sharing other people's autopsy reports with his homies and is obviously unethical than a mofo. His name is Chris Shelton. And in 2014, he was fired from another force for posting photos with racist minstrel dolls. The image you see before you is a picture of Chris Shelton next to another unimportant individual with a pair of black face dolls sandwiched between them. The two appear to be very comfortable and somewhat proud to smile for such a selfie they would go on to later share publicly. I'm sure that made good old Mike Christian's look his heart smile. So I guess Tamla's husband's claim that she was painted in blackface at the funeral home was not far-fetched at all. Because, and this is gonna shock some people, but when I went into the funeral home, I probably scared shit out of everybody because I yelled, what the f as loud as I could. I walked in and I saw my wife look like she had shoe polish on her face, black shoe polish all over her face. You don't cover up the bruising with black shoe polish. My wife is my color, mm. you know, and, but yet her, her skin was this color, that it, like blackface. I wondered if her body was painted at the coroner's office before it even got to the funeral home now that we know our little deputy coroner here might have a little fascination with black paint. And for those of you who decipher sarcasm with a slight delay, I'm being facetious. The funeral home was fully capable of completing such a paint job themselves. But wait, let's back that up a bit. Upon more research, I found evidence that further supports Tamla's husband's blackface allegation. Turns out the chief coroner, Lauren W. McDonald III, is also the owner of the funeral home responsible for Tamla's service arrangements. You heard right, Mr. McDonald is the proud owner of McDonald and Son Funeral Home of Cumming, Georgia. So the likelihood that Chris Shelton's dirty little fascination with blackface may have fueled someone's sick idea of a joke to do it to Tamla is highly probable. 
So let me break it down for you. You've got a deputy coroner who appears to be fascinated with racial archetypes working alongside the chief coroner who just so happens to own the funeral home, which serviced a black woman whom previously succumbed to a questionable death in the presence of nine white women and two men, who was painted in blackface by an unknown funeral home staff member, all of which coincidentally took place in a county that has historically proven to be a hotbed of racial tension since 1912. Let's go a little deeper and take a look at one of Forsyth's most prominent elected officials. This is Ron Freeman, a 32-year law enforcement veteran and current Forsyth County Sheriff who began his tenure working for the Sheriff's Office in 1987. Ron has been around for quite some time. He started his career in law enforcement during the exact year of the Racial Justice March where activists from all over came to bring awareness to the county's racist history. They were met with mass hostility and violence and told to leave. Throughout the march, people threw rocks, shouted the N-word, and told the group to go home. So before I proceed, let me remind you that it would be safe to assume that Mr. Ron Freeman was and is well aware of the dark history ingrained in Forsyth County, Georgia. As a matter of fact, he's been known to be quite participatory. So what I'm about to tell you should not come as a shocker. Freeman was hired in 2014 by an agency within the city of Brookhaven, but was forced to resign after he tried to cover up the termination of one of his colleagues who had been let go for his racist behavior. Let's back up and take a trip down memory lane. You remember this handsomely deficient face, right? Let me remind you, this is Chris Shelton, the deputy coroner I mentioned earlier who assisted in Tamla's autopsy. Well, once upon a time, Mr. Ron Freeman here tried to do his homie a solid and cover up his termination file, but it didn't work. He got caught and instead was forced to resign, which was no real type of punishment if you ask me, but who cares about my unsolicited opinion? It didn't really matter because Freeman, being the tenacious critter he is, was determined to fight back. And I guess he said to himself, if being unemployed, I'm gonna go run for sure. And that way, I'll be the head honcho around here and I can cover up anything I want. And so he did. He ran for sheriff with former captain Frank Huggins by his side to serve as his campaign manager. The two made a great pair because neither of them has an ethical compass within them. So when Frank Huggins was arrested for against a child, Freeman had his back just like he did with Chris Shelton and spoke out publicly defending him. Huggins was convicted and sentenced to 10 years probation. He a child and he only got 10 years probation. Again, no type of punishment for what he did if you ask me, but who cares about my unsolicited opinion? The moral of this story is there is none. There are no morals in this part of Georgia because Ron Freeman was then elected sheriff by the people of Forsyth County. Go figure. Let's talk about Jose Barrera, John's boyfriend who was present at what was supposed to be a ladies only sleepover. I guess he identified as a woman that night or didn't understand the assignment. Barrera was a pretrial probation officer working for the sheriff's office at the time. And by the look of his track record, he didn't disappoint, falling right in line with the disgraceful shortcomings of his predecessors. He'd been fired sometime before from the state probation office, along with another officer, for lying about the relationship between the two. He was fired a second time from the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office for using his position to access information about Tamla's case and sharing it with his girlfriend and others who were present the night she died. As you can see, when it comes to the pursuit of justice in the mysterious death of Tamla Horsford, there are many reasons to be concerned. I will share in depth with you all of the reasons in the upcoming part two that I'm about to mention. For one, her cause of death doesn't align with her injuries and no one, not even the medical examiner, cares to make it make sense. Two, I find it interesting that 11 people attended the same party and have no idea what happened to Tamla the night she died, though none of their stories align. And if you pay close attention, you'll notice their stories kept changing, leaving holes no one could explain. 
I plan to point out the contradictions in each of their statements to law enforcement and let you decide for yourself and brace yourselves because this just may be more than you're ready for. And three, I will reveal the most shocking conflict of interest of them all. And I'll share with you why I think this case didn't stand to get a fair chance even after it was reinvestigated by the GBI. Are you as passionate about this case as I am? If so, be a part of the change by signing the petition to get the FBI involved. You will be able to find the quick access link below. Share it with your friends, your family, your coworkers, anybody you can. And don't forget, Tamla could be your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter. What would you want? The goal is to get 1 million signatures to support the push in the fight for justice for Tamla. Y'all, this stuff is happening way too often and we've got to pull together in order to see things change. Stay tuned, you guys, because there's a lot of information you need to be aware of. One thing's for sure, knowledge is power. We need to share Tamla's story until she gets justice. There's no reason this case should still be unsolved. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a beat. Until next time, love hard on the ones you love, stay around people who make you smile, and may your hearts overflow with joy until it spills over everywhere you go. My name is Shiro, and until next time, I'm out.